Hi y'all. In this video, instead of doing my long form on one topic uh, only, I'm going to do a couple of different topics for slightly less exhaustive dis uh, discussion of them. And so, uh, the, the, uh, the travel ban, the family separation issue, voting and illegal immigration, and uh, asylum seekers. You know, really simple stuff. Alright, so as I'm sure you know that the, uh, the Supreme Court upheld Trump's travel ban in its entirety, quite properly. Uh, the court focused on statutory arguments from the Immigration Naturali Naturalization Act. Uh, so that's the posture of the case. It came up at, through an injunction. Um, but his first executive order would have been lawful. His second one would have been lawful. Even ones that were much worse than his first and his second would have been lawful. And the reason for it is that even though there are statutes that purport to, de to delegate to the president, uh, certain powers in relation to refusing entry to uh, aliens. The power is actually plenary. Uh, it's plenary and exclusive to the executive. It is the touchstone of sovereignty to be able to say, no, you can't come in for any reason uh, that you choose, whether it's a good reason or a bad reason. Um, and this is just, this comes from the law of nations, which was on the lips of our framing uh, generation on the founders' lips. In fact, they even wrote the law of nations. Uh, one of the enumerated powers for Congress is to pass laws to punish violations of the law of nations. It's very important. It's how nations get along. And uh, so you can go look at that, but there are a couple different provisions, one of which is that uh, a good prince... Oh, it, this has some interesting anachronisms in it. It was written about 20 years, 25 years before, actually, maybe, yeah, little, somewhere around there, I don't remember the exact dates, before the founding. And uh, one of the cute little anachronisms in it, among others, is um, it, there's a section there that says, uh, dealing with the ratification of treaties and their validity and whatnot, it goes, treaties entered to by republics are real treaties, you know, so, <laughs> yay, republics are finally in. So this is written mostly on the backdrop of uh, Europe and, and monarchies, but a good prince of the land will offer the great offices of humanity to all who come to his shores. Once a foreigner comes into the shores who's been admitted, it's the sovereign's duty, the, a good prince's duty, a proprietor's duty to take care of their guests the same as they would their own countrymen, and that religion is not in and of itself a reason to exclude someone from the offices of uh, humanity in general and a whole bunch of other things in particular. And, but then later on it says, but of course, when these people come in, uh, they, have to be, they have to conform their conduct and their preachments to the laws of the land in which they've come into. And if they're unwilling to do that, they can be sent out from the, uh, you know, the realm. So if you have some religion that has some views that are hostile to the ordered liberty of the society in which you're going, you can be excluded on, the, on those grounds. This was, like I said, uh, it's, it's in Article 1, um, Section 8, Clause 10, I think. Uh, the, uh, Congress has an enumerated power, explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, to punish, uh, enact laws to punish violations of the law of nations, and that's part of the law of nations. The sovereign can exclude anyone from the realm, pretty much for any reason, that he wants. Now, very occasionally, some weird issue will arise and, and there's limited judicial review. But as the court has noted, it's extremely circumscribed. And in fact, the beginning, the end of it is, is there any, uh, any credible reason um, that has been given for the policy as it's written on its face? Uh, you know, as a prima facie appears, is there any justification for it? If there is, that's the end of it. You don't look behind it. But in any event, so there's statutes. Uh, this case was decided on statutory grounds. Uh, Congress purports to delegate to the president certain powers in relation to excluding people from uh, our borders. But the power is actually plenary, and it's exclusive to the executive. There's a case from way back in the day called uh, Youngstown, and it describes the president's power in three different situations. And so when one of those is where both Congress and the President agree. That's where the, that's where the President's power is the strongest, because both political branches uh, agree on one particular policy. And uh, so there's that. And then you have the Twilight Zone, uh, where the President has the power to act. Uh, Congress may or may not have the power to act, but whether it does or doesn't, or thinks it does or doesn't, it hasn't in fact acted. And so that's the in-between state. And then you have like when the President's power is at its weakest, when Congress has pa uh, passed a statute telling the president, you are prohibited from doing this, but the president also has some authority to act on his own. And then the question is, uh, can he violate a statute that purports to tell him he can't do something uh, when that thing that he is doing is derived from a power that is inherent in being the chief executive? 
So those are the three types of, of uh, pres the, the three strengths of presidential power in acting. Um, foreign relations is plenary and it's exclusive to the executive, except for that which is expressly uh, mentioned in the Constitution, namely the ratification of treaties in the Senate. Uh, but on, with in conducting foreign affairs, the president is the only person who conducts our foreign affairs, and usually he does it through his lieutenant, the Secretary of State. Uh, so you know he delegates it to one of his subordinates, but it is it, it is the president who is tasked with that. It is uh, as I mentioned, it's plenary and it's an exclusive power, except for what is uh, given to the Congress after the fact. Congress can't interfere, intervene. Uh, it can simply uh, pass yay or nay on uh, you know the results of whatever's been negotiated and those types of things. Immigration, uh, what people will add in from what countries is part of foreign policy. Is you know, So it's both in, in the ambit of the president's powers. Uh, it's nice that Congress has written a statute completely unnecessary. Congress could purport to write a statute that says the president can't do this. The president would still be able to do it. Now, the uh, <coughs> I've, I've read various articles written by lawyers, and one of them started off pretty, you know, saying pretty well, saying, oh, I thought it was a uh, you know, pretty much case over, but then an old law school professor of mine called me. Um, we started talking about Kennedy's opinion, and that seems to be opening up a pathway for further litigation down the road, which uh, something he had missed in the original opinion, which is Article 3 standing, namely that uh, the petitioners, um, the, the, the plaintiffs below, uh, aren't prohibited from bringing their cause of action. They can still get into court. They're just going to lose on the merits right away because their, their case has no merit. But they still have standing to file the paperwork and to have it read by a judge and to be decided on its merits. Uh, so there's that. Uh, the court says, yes, yes, you have Article Three standing, uh, but then in other places in the opinion on various different things, um, it says stuff that pretty much makes it plain that there's not a lot you got going for you going forward to include part of it. This was an injunction. Part of the opinion says that the injunction in this case was, uh, the, the granting of it was an abuse of discretion by the, by the courts below. Primarily, uh, well, for a number of reasons, one of which is that the complainants, the people who, the plaintiffs, the people who are complaining, uh, have not managed to demonstrate that they have any success, of, they have any chance of succeeding on the merits, that, that they have not demonstrated they're likely to succeed on the merits. Now, this uh, one law article I was reading was about how, uh, you know, a good enough lawyer could do this. This case, when it went to the court, was argued between, you know, two lawyers were, were there, one representing uh, Trump and one representing everybody else. And the two guys there, uh, one's the Solicitor General of the United States, one is the former acting Solicitor General of the United States. His name is Neil Katyal. He is one of the best lawyers in, in the country. If you go look at like an itemization, of, uh, a categorization of lawyers, he's in band one, the tier one, and the only people who are above tier one are what are called the superstars, and that's five people, because they are just masters at everything. They're all over the place. They're, every time you turn around, there they are. These are like uh, uh, Donald Varelli, Paul Clement, people like that. Uh, Seth Waxman. Um, all five of the people in the superstar area are, except for one, are former Solicitors General of the United States. And one of them was an assistant to the Solicitor General of the United States, Carter Phillips, I think it is. But anyway, uh, so Neil Katyal, when he argued against the Solicitor General uh, prior to that day, he had argued, Neil Katyal, had argued more cases in the Supreme Court than the Solicitor General, and that was just last term. Uh, he argued six cases before the Supreme Court in the, in, uh, the term, uh, in the last term, not the one that just ended, the one before it. Uh, the current Solicitor General has argued seven cases. Uh, so on the day that the Trump versus Hawaii uh, case went up there, that was the seventh case. I think it's Neil Katyal's third case that this term. Uh, anyway, very prolific uh, lawyer, brilliant. Um, he, anyway, the, the, I mentioned the superstars. There was a panel where they're talking about the uh, Affordable Care Act cases, and Paul Clement said something, and, and you could taste just a little, a little bit of jealousy in Katyal's voice. He goes, look, Paul, I know you are the lawyer of your generation, which is true. Anyway, it just cracked me up. So, uh, that guy, has brought everything forward, uh, really, really good at doing this. And after having heard it on the merits, the court says, e every, if, if everything you say is true, you're still not going to, you're still unlikely to su succeed on the merits, uh, go away. And then you had a couple of desperate um, dissents. 
and the the law art, the law uh, journal the journal article I was reading the commentary whatever it was had mentioned that Kennedy was offering the lower courts a pathway forward petitioners uh, I'm sorry the complainants a pathway forward in the lower courts and that his old law professor friend thought that Breyer's decision I'm sorry Breyer's opinion was written to be to serve as guidance to the lower courts I'm like in the Ninth Circuit it does make sense to me that the lower that the you know they'd look to the losing side of the case to find the source of law that actually has some you know, sensibility to it, given the way the Ninth Circus operates. Uh, because it's was, it was just pragmatic. Breyer's, one of his complaints is that, oh, it says there's this waiver, waiver provision for these countries and you know, certain circumstances for people coming from there, but so few of them have been issued. And you know, that bespeaks discrimination. Well, of course, so uh, few of them have been issued. The reason that these uh, countries have been put on the list is because of their terrorism problems, their threat to the United States. It's perfectly reasonable to conclude that the people who are there are going to have much a much more difficult time meeting the uh, whatever the re waiver requirements are in order to get the waiver. You know, duh. One of the reasons that these countries are there is because they have very poor policing practices, and you can't get good criminal histories on people. You can't find out if they're terrorists. It makes it very difficult for the people applying for these different kinds of visas uh, to be able to come here. But, you know, them's the breaks. If their country would get a good criminal justice system with computers that had records that could be checked, all the problems would go away. Anyway, Sotomayor wrote a, a dissenting opinion that doesn't even have the patina of a pretense of being a legal opinion. It's um, you know, mostly political philosophy. Uh, anyway, she was so desperate at one point, she whined that this this agency review that was done while the cases while the uh, case was working its way through the courts is it's suspect because the report when it was filed and made you know, made public after a FOIA request was only 17 pages long, as though that says anything. If she thinks that's something that's going to call into question the reasoning that undergirds it. Uh, you know, the work that was done behind it, then I guess she doesn't think anyone's ever been actually properly convicted of a crime. The report of the jury's work is very short. It's usually not even, a, you, know, you don't even need a full sheet of paper for it. It's got like the caption, you know, the, the title is, you know, so, you know, state versus so-and-so, case number, blah, 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 um, the offense, and then, you know, not guilty, guilty, you know, whatever the little boxes are, you check, signature of the foreman, you turn that in. That's the report. Uh, that does not mean that the jury didn't sit there and deliberate for you know two months. So a lot of work went into it, but all they're doing is, is reporting on the outcome of their work. You're not entitled to see the work. You can't pierce, you know, you can't interfere in the jury's deliberations. The courts in the Ninth Circuit want uh, have chastised the Trump administration for not bringing forth enough evidence. You know, uh, so they want the the executive to turn over his documents to them so they can review those documents, classified and not, to determine whether or not he has the better view of, of that. They want to do his job for him. It's like, no, it's court. It's none of your business. These, these various types of uh, memo or memoranda or notes or whatever it is that were put into this are within the executive department and the, you're not entitled to see them. You can't order the president to give you these, these kinds of things. They, that's core executive function. Uh, it's beyond your power. Uh, anyway, so there's that. Now, uh, another law article that I read was on the enforcement of the various laws at the border with respect to minors and their parents. And this guy, this, this is why one of the reasons I, I despise lawyers. Uh, they like to interpret words. And when they say interpret, uh, what, what they very often mean is make shit up as you go along and just say, oh, I'm just interpreting the words on, in the statute. He was complaining... Uh, that, that it's entirely possible for the Trump administration to enforce the law without engaging in activities that would require separating parents and children. What he means by interpret the law is to do what previous administrations have done when they in interpreted the law, which is to just ignore uh, half of the law. Uh, I call this the night court version of uh, law enforcement. There are two provisions in the, in the statute that's relevant. and uh, One is civil, one is criminal. The civil uh, penalty that will be assessed for uh, violating our borders that you're coming across illegally is a $50 fine. So uh, there's a $50 fine, time served, you know, that's the night court version. 
And the real version would be the first part and the second part. The second part has a criminal provision, which is you get arrested, you get taken to a jail, you get prosecuted. Um, the very reason that we have the, pro the problem of so many people coming along uh, on our borders this way is precisely because previous administrations have decided to interpret the law to mean just don't enforce it with respect to minors and their parents. Um, this, these kinds of, uh, this kind of behavior on the behalf of these people coming across with their children is intentional. It is, uh, Justice Kennedy had a good joke about this in, in an argument. It says, you know, counsel, your argument sounds a lot like a man who's murdered both of his parents then goes to court begging for mercy on account of being an orphan. It, these people coming across are engineering their own, engineering the own circumstances that makes them compassion, you know, makes them sympathetic. Look what I, I'm here with my child. How could you do this to me? That's precisely why they do it, because they want to exploit our compassion to get what they want. After having dragged them through all the dangers and hazards, they then chastise us for putting them in facilities where they're fed, watered, and everything, and you know, kept, uh, kept very safe, given care, food, all, the, all this other stuff. They want to complain that we're enforcing our laws, and that that is imperiling them. But all the other shit that they did negligently, endangering their children's lives, and all that stuff you should just not notice. You know, uh, Stephen Fry had a little quip about this and is the Catholic Church a force for good in the world? And uh, he brought up the child, uh, you know, the pedophilia priests, um, the, a couple of other things, uh, their, con their policy on condoms and everything. And he's uh, chastising Ann Whittacombe. He says, oh, you know, you get up and say this, uh, this, that, and the other. He goes, you just remind me of, you know, a man on trial for a homicide. And he's like, oh, well, of course you'd bring up that burglary and, you know, that kidnapping. You never mention I give my father a birthday card. So, you know, they're trying to get sympathy. And in this case, what they're doing is they're manufacturing their own sympathy by putting their children's lives in danger. So that way they can be more sympathetic, uh, be a more sympathetic type of beggar, essentially. So, uh, they are they, they find out what we prioritize in America. You know we're a reasonably compassionate country, and the, reasonably free country. Blah blah blah. Uh, actually, a very free country. And then they try to exploit that. It's just they want to co-opt it. And so some of the responses that I get about uh, th these uh, these people is uh, you know you'll hear arguments about it's meant to shift the demographics, and the response to that will be for voting purposes. The response to that will be illegals can't vote. Well, they can't vote legally. That doesn't necessarily stop them. But even if that's true, they, they just simply fail to notice the next part of the argument. They have children who grow up and are going to be, oddly enough, sympathetic to the plight of their, their parents. And when these children can vote, which policies do you think they're going to vote for? The ones that will see their criminal parents deported or the ones that will see their criminal parents spared punishment for the violation of the laws? It's a no-brainer. That's precisely why uh, they, they want it this way. That's why they want the law to be interpreted to be enforced in such a fashion that it has no teeth. So that way it continually uh, and perpetually encourages the same type of behavior uh, in the future that we've had in the past on exactly the same kinds of policies. Now, of course, they don't come right out and say what they want is open borders for everyone. Just every time you try to do anything that infringes on it, they say, oh, no, that's no, you're not being compassionate. Anyway, it's stupid. And uh, the last refuge is that some asylum seekers are involved in this. You know, people come to this country for asylum. Uh, uh, fuck off. Asylum takes uh, place in two different two different types of si of asylum. Uh, two different ways asylum is pursued: affirmative, uh, affirmatively, and defensively. With respect to the affirmative cases, uh, none of these issues arise. I mean, now occasionally one of those will get a, uh, put in a facility and separated from the family for other reasons. I'm not saying it never happens. It's just not the, the normal way it goes. And the reason for it is quite simple. These people fill out their, pa their paperwork. They seek out the entry ports and they say, they go there and they, hey, Mr. Border Patrol agent man, here's my paperwork. I'm here to claim asylum for, you know, whatever the, the reasons are. We are extremely accommodating to those people. And when you're in an affirmative asylum seeking case, any positive decision in your favor ends the matter and you're granted asylum. Okay? But let's say you go through every process, you go through, uh, you know, you immigrate, immigration judge, your case, every, you go through everything in, you know, the alphabet soup of Washington in relation, in relation to immigration. And then ultimately they decide, eh, you don't have merit here. You, you can go you know, appeal. But when, once you've lost your affirmative case, then you still have 
your defensive case to bring up. So you get, uh, you get all the process of the affirmative cases, and then on top of that, all of the process of the defensive cases. Now, what are defensive cases? Those are cases where people illegally enter uh, the, the country, and then when they get caught, they go, Oh, my word, I'm going to claim asylum. That's a stalling tactic that they like to use, which is why a case, uh, anyway, that's why the Congress put in there that with respect to tolling provisions after notice of removal, uh, it, anyway, you can't toll it once you get the uh, the notice of removal because what people would do is it, it, they would delay and delay and delay and delay until they'd met the 10-year thing. Uh, even while the case was in court and Congress said, no, this isn't working. People are just exploiting the system. Let's snatch that out of there. Once you're given your notice of intention, you know, the uh, a notice from the uh, ICE people or whoever, that they intend to deport you, your, your notice to appear type thing, uh, the clock stops. You don't get credit while that case is pending. So anyway, there, there, you know, there is that. Uh, it is simply, the defensive claim is simply, uh, most of the time, a stalling tactic. But on the off chance that out of every 10, 20, 30, 50,000 people who will file one of these defensive claims, there may yet still be one out there who the person, for fear or whatever, entered illegally and has a meritorious claim. So we give all of those people legal process. We don't have to. We do it because if there is someone in there who has a valid claim, we would much rather undertake the expense of all the hearings and the lawyers and the judges for all the meritless cases to make sure that when the real case is there, that, that person, that asylum seeker, gets his fair hearing and a proper resolution to his case on its merits. And in order to get that one guy out of every 10,000 or whatever it is, we will do the other 9,999 cases that have no merit simply on the off chance that eventually one of them will have merit. This is like uh, uh, in relation to how we do our jury trials. We would much rather set a guilty man free that can then convict an innocent one. We would much rather uh, give all this legal process to someone who doesn't have a meritorious claim than to not give it and to turn someone away who has a meritorious claim simply because of you know some stupid reason he decided not to go and, and seek it affirmatively, but rather try to sneak in and then claims it defensively. So whenever people bring up that, you need to know the difference between affirmative asylum seekers and defensive asylum seekers. The ones who get separated from their families are the defensive asylum seekers. Uh, they're the ones who are invoking asylum, whether or not they have a claim, in order to delay their removal proceedings. And uh, they know that this can take years in some cases. Uh, and they, they also know that we're a very good country. We're a very compassionate country. And uh, you know, the catch and release type programs will just let them wander off and then they can melt into the, the, you know, the fabric of, of America and linger. And you no, know, that's not what Trump is about. He's like, no, we need to stop this now. And we're just going to get very aggressive on this. Oddly enough, uh, when you have something that builds a deterrent in and you actually enforce that deterrent, it has a chance of deterring people, unlike when you build in a deterrent that has teeth and then you refuse to enforce it, it in effect doesn't exist because it's not being enforced. And that has been the previous practice, the practice of previous administrations. Uh, nope, we will just not enforce half of the law in relation uh, to people who recklessly endanger the lives of their children uh, because it would make for bad PR. Trump, you know, is he's doing what he should be doing on it. We have these laws. You don't come in our country without our consent. You are here uh, purely by our sufferance. It is our largesse that you are here. And, uh, well, we're running out of our patience. I think in addition to the border wall, we should get some big old fucking flashing neon signs that say, now you've seen the U.S. border, go the fuck home. <laughs> anyway, have a great day.